1940, the gross and swaggering Hermann Goering is second in command of Nazi Germany. As a Nazi warlord, Goering has everything he wants. Unlimited wealth and unlimited power. But all Goering has gained is now in jeopardy. To keep his place in the sun, Goering must fulfill a vow of conquest. He must destroy England. As the Nazis look out tonight from their blatant, flattering, panoplied Germany, they cannot find one single friendly eye in the whole circumference of the globe. General Goering says that we have been spared so far because Nazi Germany is so humane. They cannot bear to do anything, to hurt anybody. All they ask for is the right to live and to be let alone to conquer and kill the weak. Their humanity forbids them to apply severities to the strong. May well be. Winston Churchill is Prime Minister of Britain as World War II engulfs Europe. Yet strangely, this man who now rallies a nation was virtually ignored by his countrymen only a few years before. Through the 1920s and early 30s, Churchill is a nomadic journalist. Once a political giant, he is now exiled from the corridors of power because of a blunder committed during World War I. Says Churchill, I have been too ready to attempt projects which are hazardous or even forlorn. Unlikely ever to hold high office in Britain, he wanders the globe on trivial errands. His opinions are disregarded by most statesmen. He is considered a little eccentric when he warns of a growing menace in Germany. In Germany during this time, the Nazi movement is gaining power. Attracted by its ritual, a moody, erratic, one-time airline executive, Hermann Goering, becomes Adolf Hitler's right-hand man. Through Hitler's early struggles for power, Goering is constantly at his side, a rotund balloon tethered to Hitler's will. When Hitler gains total control of Germany, he makes Goering second in command of the Third Reich. Unlike Hitler, Goering wants nothing more from life. He has adulation enough to satisfy even his ravenous ego. And he has wealth enough to fulfill dreams of glory which have obsessed him since childhood. Hermann Goering is soon known as the playboy of the Third Reich. Racing down the autobahns in one of his supercharged roadsters, he delights in the prerogatives of wealth and power. To gratify his taste for country living, he builds Karrenhall, a gigantic mountain lodge rivaling Hitler's Berchtesgaden. Goering is unashamedly a glutton. His insatiable craving for candies and cakes is matched by his appetite for gold, jewels, and precious art. With these, he dazzles and impresses the world. Close associates see through Goering's ostentation. They know him as a weak and indecisive man, tortured by doubts and jealousies, a chronic drug addict, kept from madness only by periodic visits to a private sanatorium. But at Cannon Hall, Goering plays the feudal prince, the genial host, lord and master of all he surveys. David L. Goering's special toy, 
He is its founder and sole commander. With carte blanche from Hitler, he builds and trains the world's largest air force, perfecting techniques of strategic bombing, making possible terror raids on distant cities. Germany alone, among all the countries of Europe, forges this frightening new instrument of war. logical target for Goering's planes is unprepared. A nation determined on peace, unwilling to hear or heed the warnings of men like Winston Churchill. If we are to place ourselves in a position of security, if we are to bring our armaments up to the level below which they should never have been allowed to fall, if we are to have a fulfillment of the pledge that our Air Force should not be inferior to that of any country within striking distance of these shores, then we must practice something of that concentration and vigor which is shown in the dictator country. Anyone can see that public opinion is growing in favor of compulsory national service in all its forms, and especially in the highest form. For the most part, to a complacent England, Winston Churchill is a crusty old war lover, yearning for the smell of gunpowder. Time and time again, he points out what he considers obvious, that Hitler's aim is world conquest. And time and time again, he is greeted with indifference or ridicule. Summer 1939. A badly frightened Hermann Goering plans the start of World War II. He is sure it means disaster. But Hitler's orders are clear, and Goering lives by the credo, if the Fuhrer wants it, then two and two make five. months of World War II, Goering's pilots meet no effective opposition. They are free to devastate Norway, Holland, Belgium, and finally, France. To Goering, it seems that one need only order an attack to celebrate a victory. Becoming bolder, he pesters Hitler to reserve some future battle for the Luftwaffe alone. June 1940, the outbreak of war has turned the English government upside down. Churchill, a vindicated prophet, finds himself prime minister. Almost immediately, there is crisis. Word comes that the British army is cornered at the French seaport, Dunkirk. begins an all-out attack on the British Army, struggling to evacuate Dunkirk. To give Goering the opportunity he wants, Hitler has ordered the German army to hold back. The Luftwaffe is ordered to finish off the British. But for the first time, the RAF opposes the Luftwaffe in strength.
RAF's victory is decisive, measured by the 330,000 troops who escape from Dunkirk and safely reach England. We have become the sole champion now in arms to defend the world core. We shall do our best to be worthy of that high honor. We shall defend our island and with the British Empire around us, we shall fight on, unconquerable, until the curse of Hitler is lifted from the brow of men. Goering has failed at Dunkirk. Unable to bear the Fuhrer's displeasure, he feels compelled to make a gesture of bravado. He begs to be allowed to attack England in force, predicting that he will smash the RAF within a month. Incredibly, Hitler agrees. Goering, who has just failed to destroy a British army, now will attempt to annihilate the English nation. David L. Wolberry. In the first days of August 1940, England will be called upon to fight for national survival. Though largely unprepared, the English have one advantage, a new detection system called radar. It is 11 a.m. August 15, 1940. Radar contact is made with massive German squadrons, more than 1,000 planes in all. In the Air Defense Control Center, plotting maps show the scope of the onslaught. Within a half hour, it is clear that a decisive battle will be fought over England. Without radar warning, many British planes would be caught on the ground or exhaust their fuel searching for the enemy. But with radar, the RAF's interceptor squadrons can aim directly for the still unseen enemy. The Luftwaffe crosses the English coastline. Because of a gross misjudgment by Goering, Britain's radar network is considered ineffectual and the vital antenna towers are passed by unmolested. Even so, the Luftwaffe is far stronger than the RAF. Goering's pilots are confident that they will swiftly clear the skies of English resistance. At battle's end, Britain's gallant squadrons come home. Now they are counted, the quick and the dead. and in the 22 days of unbroken combat that follow, the British set an amazing record, outkilling the Germans by two to one. But Britain's valiant band of expert pilots is shrinking daily and will soon be totally depleted. Goering is about to win control of the air over England, the essential first step in the conquest of Britain. Says Winston Churchill, never have so many owed so much to so few. But the few are not enough. 
The RAF has no further reserves to draw on. Defeat stares Churchill in the face. Yet now, with typical Churchillian audacity, he orders the RAF to bomb Berlin, a token of his defiance. Goering, depressed by the RAF's valiant defense of Britain, now is stunned by the Berlin raid. It has long been his favorite boast that enemy bombs will never fall on German soil. Now, his vow of mockery, he must face the Fuhrer's wrath. Hitler demands retaliation for the Berlin raid. Even if it means abandoning Goering's effort to destroy the RAF, Goering is afraid to disagree with Hitler and defend his strategy. London is the target of a new German strategy. By shattering the English capital, Hitler hopes to break the nation's morale. On September 7, 1940, the new phase of the battle begins. Since the invention of the airplane, visionaries have warned of death from the sky. There have been ominous portents in China and Spain. But not until this night does humanity know the full horror of total war. of London are, of course, a part of Hitler's plan. Little does he know the spirit of the British nation or the tough fiber of the Londoner. This wicked man, the repository and embodiment of many forms of soul-destroying hatred, this monstrous product of former wrongs and shame, has now resolved to try to break our famous island race by a process of indiscriminate slaughter and destruction. What he has done is to kindle a fire in British hearts here and all over the world which will glow long after all traces of the conflagrations he has caused in London have been removed. For 57 consecutive days, the ordeal goes on. London is a smoking wasteland, a graveyard for more than 5,000 men, women, and children. Winston Churchill is in his heart, not at all sure how it will end. How much more will the people have to bear, he asks. What is the limit to their vitality? He knows he must rally them. Somehow he must stir his people, lift them, give them the spirit to carry on in the face of torturous adversity. So he plays a brave charade, as only Churchill can. Once in a thousand years can a single man inspire millions to unrealized heights of courage. Such a moment is September 1940. and secure at Karen Hall. Goering's courage ebbs as Churchill's flows. There is no sign of England's collapse. In fact, Churchill's latest speeches are stronger, more defiant than before. Relying on morphine injections to bolster his sagging spirits, Goering waits fearfully for Hitler's inevitable summons. When the reckoning comes, Goering is abject before the Fuhrer's withering scorn. In a vainglorious moment, 
He had promised to devastate England. He has succeeded only in disgracing himself. Says Hitler finally, something strange has happened in Britain. The ancient city of London lives on. Says Winston Churchill, in explanation of his victory and in praise of his countrymen. No one can guarantee success in war. He can only deserve it. In 1945, Hermann Goering is captured by the Allies at Fischhorn, Austria. In his baggage is found a fortune in emeralds and rubies, and a hundred tablets of morphine. Hidden somewhere on his person is a tablet of cyanide. This will save him from what he considers an undignified death on the gallows at Nuremberg. Churchill lives on to see final Allied victory. Journalist, orator, political maverick, disgraced at the age of 50 and battled at 60, Winston Spencer Churchill is gloriously vindicated in his 70th year.